so for going forward, to me this is really exciting because we did, we, we basically got a tutorial that probably most people in St. Paul and other words don't, they don't understand tax increment financing. It's complicated as you know and it's um, specific to projects and properties and all those kinds of things. But now that you've got this information, uh, my guess is you have lots of good questions to ask and that's the time for now. And so if you'll just raise your hand, I will come out with the microphone. If there's somebody particular that you would like to answer your question, you could say that. Um, I believe we can go for, correct me Steve, up to an hour, but um, I'll just take it as we go. But try and keep your um, comments and questions to the point so that the panelists have a chance to answer. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to add, um, maybe add to the discussion a little bit. Is this on? Um, so I think there's a few context issues that are missing. Um, there's, a, there's a broader issue because we're in St. Paul, is how does St. Paul do with TIF? Um, I think it's widely abused in St. Paul. Um, it's maybe more widely abused in Chicago. There was a study done by some academics many years ago about how badly it's abused in the Chicago area, but I think it's badly abused in St. Paul, but we're not analyzing it. Um, John alluded to 20 million. The best figure that I could get out of the data that the city produces is that we're spending $26 million a year on TIF districts. But I think Mr. Kudrowski's sort of initial definition of TIF didn't quite get at it. Um, first of all, there's the issue of public purpose. How do we define that? Um, I would argue that a stadium, of which has been a beneficiary of TIF in the city, which is argued as a public purpose, but yet for the purpose of a private team, that's arguable whether that is a public purpose or not. But regardless of how you define it, the real question is, are we getting a benefit? If the in does the increase in the increment happen so that if a project, say, a piece of land is worth $10 million, a developer comes in and says, when I'm done with this project, it's going to worth, be worth $20 million. So the additional $10 million in value, the increment on that will be a benefit to the city and to the public. But yet, the taxes that we forego during the period of the district, whether it's five years or 10 or 20, versus what we bring in when it's done, is that a benefit or not? We should be able to analyze that. We should be able to say, okay, before, you know, we, we gave up $200,000 in taxes over this 10-year period, but for the next 10 years, it generated a million dollars in taxes, so we had an $800,000 gain. I think, however, if we look at it, we're going to find that we're not getting the benefits because the projections are rosy, as John alluded to, so that we end up not getting any tax increase or the, the project doesn't become worth $20 million, it becomes worth $12 million. So the increment's only two million and the tax on that increment is small. So, you know, getting at the transparency piece, how do we get at this? Every TIF project that we do in St. Paul should be on a readily accessible website. And, and one thing that would catch the public's attention is the value of the project and here how much the TIF is. If you tell people we're giving two million here and three million here and eight million there, um, you'll get the public's attention. But they have no idea. They don't know, for example, that the project you alluded to with Macy's, it's an $11 million TIF that the Port Authority is bringing forward, but part of that money is going to build a practice arena for the wild in that building. That's not the only use for the building, but that is one of the uses. So I think transparency involves not just the dollar amount, but also how the project's being used. And the final point, sort of just to hopefully stimulate more discussion is, there's a difference to me between a blighted property and a polluted property. Um, they can be the same, but when TIF was originally created, it was because many projects around the country areas were blighted. Um, it wasn't because they were polluted, they'd just been abandoned, the whole white flight, you know, all sorts of factors. And so TIF was seen as a, and at the time it seemed like a really smart tool to address that. If you've got polluted property that you need to clean up, the question is, who should pay for it? For example, the agency you now head up bought a building in downtown St. Paul that was torn down to make way for the St. Paul, the new Saints ballpark. There was a $7 million cleanup that was involved that somehow wasn't detected when the project was purchased. 
Well, whoever polluted it should have cleaned it up. Instead, the city cleaned it up. Ford is cleaning up the Ford plant because Ford polluted it. But we had the U.S. Bank building, the city of St. Paul during Norm Coleman's administration. Someone bought that on the cheap. I think it was, I think it was a, a developer that had a bigger project bought it and sold it at a profit because the cleanup was taken off his hands. So if we're looking for a device on how to clean up, that's not TIF. At least it shouldn't be TIF. Or there should be some, there is a public purpose to doing that, but I think when you muddle them together and say this is blighted because it's polluted, you can trace back to how it got polluted. Did it get polluted by the public or did it get polluted by the private? And who's your responsible? And I think that's what we're not doing, is we're not holding the polluters accountable either. So I think TIF can be a good, it can be a good use, but we have no idea because we are not measuring it and, y and it can be done. And as we continue to have it just kind of be a black hole, you can throw out any figure you want and people aren't going to understand because there's no measurable data. So I apologize for really not asking many questions there, but I just think we're, we're complicating things that we don't need to. There are some simple answers and some think simple things we can do to really get at TIFF that we haven't really addressed here tonight. Thanks. Thank you. So that was context. Um, There's a question over here. Uh, Alan, did you? Alan Arthur, a president of Aon, a developer, a nonprofit developer of affordable housing. Um, so TIF has its positives and negatives. Like any tool, it could be a hammer that's uh, wielded by a psychotic carpenter that could create damage uh, for folks. But <coughs> Mr. Manillo makes a, a powerful case that when you have 20% vacancies in some part of the community, maybe we shouldn't be building things that increase the, uh, in that area of, uh, of uh, work or development. Uh, Senator uh, Rest makes a powerful, equally powerful argument about not using it on, for example, the most valuable <laughs> land in the state. But there's one area, affordable housing, in which the demand is clear. Uh, there's no big vacancies in the affordable housing world, and it absolutely passes the but-for test. But for more capital from our communities in a broad sense, it ain't going to happen, and we're not going to build enough. I would like to ask each of you, isn't that an ideal use of TIF? Well, keeping in mind, however, that um, uh, you've changed the whole understanding of the original purpose of tax increment financing when we allow it for housing. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do, but um, tax increment financing was begun um, as a tool um, for, of urban renewal, of, um, of blight, of getting rid of blight, and that meant substandard buildings on a parcel that nobody was going to come into the core city and, and develop for manufacturing, um, for uh, jobs that paid a livable or living wage. Um, that's what the um, original purpose was. But then what happens is there's a, well, why don't we use a tax increment financing mechanism for affordable housing? But those two purposes are at cross purposes with one another. That's not really what tax increment financing was for. Why didn't we instead um, come up with a, a more appropriate, perhaps, uh, program for building um, affordable housing other than uh, tax increment financing? That's, to me, that's, that's the big question about it. Not that, um, bec because in a sense, if we say now, well, housing is really the most important thing to do, well then, what about blight? Does that mean we, shouldn't, we should tell cities, well, you can't do it for blight anymore because the most important thing is affordable housing? And I, I just find, um, and the same thing about polluted soils. I mean, that um, we, we have hazardous substance sub-districts, they're called, that are just as long as a redevelopment district. And, um, but that was not the original uh, context or purpose of tax increment. 
And maybe, um, maybe it's fine to have that um, to have that mechanism branch out into other social purposes because that's what it is. It is social engineering. It is saying that um, if we don't, if the government doesn't interfere, and that's what it is, interfere in the market, that um, the development wouldn't occur. It would just remain blighted. We wouldn't have affordable housing. We'd have polluted lands because uh, nobody's going to take a chance on them. Um, and uh, if we can't get a subsidy, then um, I'm not going to uh, build my McDonald's. But actually, you can't use it for a McDonald's. That was a bad example because you can't use it f for a property that is strictly, uh, uh, for a project that's strictly uh, uh, retail. Um, so, I, you know, I, I am sympathetic to affordable housing, but is there a better mechanism than ta for cities to participate in building affordable housing than uh, tax increment financing? Should we be satisfied with TIF in order to do um, housing projects? And it has become very, very popular since it was allowed, and I don't know exactly the period in which, which it um, came into, into being, but um, the, um, uh, it is second only to the redevelopment districts in the number of districts across the state. There's, there's over 500 housing districts, which are long, we call them the long districts, 25-year districts throughout the state of Minnesota for affordable, um, for affordable housing. Uh, second only to the redevelopment districts, both of them long ones. Um, and I, um, I, I find it, a, you know, um, um, once again, part of the, this twisted history, if you will, of, um, of how tax increment financing has been used when maybe there would have been a better model to have... Um, um, just as good a result as, um, as TIF. Um, Alan, I, I uh, <clears throat> this is probably over my head because I don't get involved in housing, but isn't your projects off the tax rolls to begin with? No. So you pay the ta property taxes. Um, well, and I would revert to uh, I, I, to what Anne has, has said because I um, uh, that there could be better projects for it that are initially was set up for for commercial. However, there are commercial projects with housing in them, um, you know, and and, and 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 if there is in fact commercial projects with housing in them that gets TIF, isn't that unfair competition to you? So. I want to come at this issue a little bit differently for a second. Um, I want to look at the economic aspects of it. So a city decides that they really want a commercial development with some housing in their downtown. Uh, let's take a Hopkins or take any of the, the first ring suburbs because they're facing some problems and they, they have trouble with their downtowns. and. Boy, they'd really like to get that a little commercial development with some nice market rate housing. Boy, the citizens of Hopkins really like that idea. But what's that doing for the metropolitan area? What's that doing for the state of Minnesota? I think it's simply moving it from another community where it would be built to that Hopkins or that St. Louis Park. There's not a net increase. Um, in in uh, in people in the metropolitan area, they've got a fixed amount of income that they spend. That's not going to change. All you're doing is tilting the table, such that things tilt your way and away from somebody else. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul have been doing this now for years, and it makes no sense. Um, makes no sense. Minneapolis wants to do this to get it from St. Paul, or from, you know, St. Paul does it to get it from Minneapolis. Doesn't make sense for the state of Minnesota or for the metropolitan area. <clears throat> I'm going to pass on that one. I haven't done much in housing at all. Hi, I'm John Broderick on the St. Paul School Board. And I think I do have a pretty good understanding of both TIF and fiscal disparities. 
but for rhetorical purposes, I'll act real dumb uh, and ask this question to anyone on the panel, and that would be, should a school district ever be in favor of a TIF project? Can I ask, does the school district ever have say in it? Yes, we are advised by the board. You're, ad you're advised. Yeah, do you have a... And we, and we, do, we do give a green light, yes. So we're, th these decisions are not made without our awareness. And we have routinely, since I've been on the board, uh, okayed them. Now, I, you put me on the spot, John, because I've been on the board for 15 years. Have we ever, as a board, uh, voiced an opinion against m making a project, a TIF project? I'm not sure, but I don't think so. My question is, as I said, more rhetorical, and, and I, maybe I shouldn't have prefaced it by the fact that I'm on the board. I'm that average citizen that Tim and I were uh, smiling about that doesn't have a clue as to what TIF's all about. So is it any good for school districts? Simple as that. I would just point out that, again, before the reforms of, um, of 2000 and we got rid of the general education levy, there was no penalty for a school district to say yes, not at all. Um, counties wanted veto power and because they, did, they could experience a deficit, but uh, school districts never did. Um, and in 2000, then, we, and we always made up the difference for them. Um, in 2000, when we got rid of the general education levy, the school districts, um, I think, became more of a real player. There was one um, instance, and I don't recall the, the um, I don't recall the community, but uh, it was a suburban community over the last couple of years where there was an, um, some extension uh, of a district that was being requested. And um, um, because of the where it was in the school district and everything like that, the school district said no. They vetoed it. And um, the city came to the legislature and asked us to overturn the veto of the, um, of the school district, and we said no. We were not going to allow that um, to happen because they reviewed it and they did not see that it was to the benefit of the school district for, I, I don't remember all the details, but uh, it was a rational kind of decision and um, they said, uh, we see no long-term benefit in allowing this district to be extended. I think it was actually an extension. And the, um, the county said okay, but the school district said no. And the city wanted a special dispensation to overrule the school district and the legislature did not entertain that, that, um, that, uh, uh, that proposal. I would answer yes for you, John. And I, I think a couple reasons why, and I think there's a few things that were brought up early on that I think we always, it's hard to define the but for test. And I think the key thing is, and I think that's a fair question, would the project have happened but for the TIF? And I think if everyone feels that that's a yes, fine, because if without it, again, one of the points I wanna make is what's the alternative by not doing the project? If you do leave the project blighted or the site blighted, it's very real possibility. And the one thing I, I there's a couple things and, and the gentleman who stepped out that I kinda wanna want to um, clarify on on TIF is, is we're, we can only recapture eligible expenses. So I think it's not, we have to prove, you know, and again, I'll go back to the Macy's site. There's a lot of stuff in there, life safety, uh, code issues and stuff like that. It's not just, you know, and, and I, John, I don't know if that's the report you were asking for that we have to basically prove that what the money has to be used for. And when we use up the eligible expenses, it, it stops. It's either a term or when we use up our expenses. And another misnomer I think that we all kind of tend to forget is the, the increment that's created, it's not necessarily 
that goes to the project. And I think that's something that um, you probably want to look for to see what's the project. If, if you're creating an increment that wouldn't have been created except for or but for the TIF, it's not necessarily 100% that's going to, to the project. So there should be, within that increment, money that does go to the school district. That's how I'll answer it. Could I uh, just, um, uh, Lee, when you say it, what would happen if a project, if, if the but for didn't work and the project was never built, uh, what might happen is somebody may come along and develop it to a greater extent or certainly to an extent that pays taxes. Um, there has to be a level of patience to, for the market to build that we don't allow. And so when we continually outpace the market with subsidies, we never reach that. And so, uh, and places that have done it, and Minneapolis, in the last five years, the, uh, Minneapolis has uh, cut down their TIF uh, down to $24 million over that time period. Same time period, St. Paul has spent $114 million in TIF. Um, uh, and we can't afford to, to, to try to match Minneapolis uh, with that kind of spending. Uh, we can't even match them even up because they're a much stronger city than we are uh, 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 commercially. So uh, I, I don't know that uh, we always talk about what if we didn't have it. Well, I don't think we'd be a desert. <laughs> uh, we, we're the most developed county in the state. So there's no blue sky. There's no uh, uh, potential development other than the Ford plant that we have in the uh, in the county, we have, and I shouldn't say that. There are obviously places. There's, there's the uh, Arden Hills, but but we're still the most developed. We are very limited on what we can we can draw from in the future as far as a tax base. So. Well, I'll finish up on that one too, John. I mean, I think the um, what if you didn't do something? I mean, for those of you who don't know me, I haven't been at the port my whole career. I I spent a lot of time working on um, projects, primarily shopping centers, throughout the upper Midwest. And a, a classic example, I mean, and you're right, you know, patients, we don't know what would be happening if we did nothing. You know, maybe something good would happen, maybe nothing would happen. Um, I leased a shopping center in Gary, Indiana. And in the early 60s, when Gary was thriving, you know, population of close to 190,000 people, now it's down to 80. I could argue that that's something, that's a city that didn't do anything. And in certain areas of, of that project or of, of that city, I, you know, driving through it, and that's primarily because I took a wrong turn and went a spot I probably shouldn't have went, but I can, you can drive by certain areas and, and you can say, here's what happens if you don't do something. And that's a case that I can say, I mean, you, you know, I, I'll use that as a case study. Look, they didn't do anything that city has dropped, you know, 50, 60 percent of its population. You're going to come up with other options too and other uh, uh, scenarios, but you don't know. Could Gary have done something different? Again, I don't know. But I can just say, when you drive through certain areas like that, you can say they did not intervene, and look what happened. I think that there's some uh, really important uh, points that have to be looked at. Is is there really the benefit or the versus the perceived benefit of the uh, one of the things is I think you can't underestimate how much you impact negatively impact the other properties when you give a subsidy because now all of a sudden you've devalued the surrounding properties in a competitive sense also you've now shifted the burden, the property tax burden to them. So they not only have to pay their share, they got to pay a portion of your share. So they're at an additional disadvantage of it. Uh, and part of what also becomes on this, and I think this is a particular problem in, in St. Paul, is it becomes that the government becomes the developer and is deciding how you do, rather than using the tools that the city has to, to determine development, they become the player in it. And, uh, so they can get the political credit and et cetera. Uh, and it really skews the market. So many of the developers don't want to play because they've got to deal, they've got to go through the city and the development agency of the city, the Port Authority, 
who and which captains. Uh, give me an example. Uh, what we just talked about is um, uh, uh, the Ford site. You talk about well, maybe you want residential on the site, and so you got to keep TIF in the in the game and stuff. Well, the city zone does zoning. The city can zone it for residential. The city doesn't have to create, uh, uh, determine that it be residential by subsidizing it. But the city gets lazy and it becomes easy because the developer then, the Port Authority or the city, uh, the HRA, could say, well, we could take credit then for this by using this subsidy, which then, but what you're not looking at on that is the development that's going away because you now have subsidized that against the other, it shifted the burden onto the other people of the city. This is also true of the example of, uh, of, of the Macy's site. There is no reason in the world that the government ought to be buying the heart of the downtown, a block in the heart of downtown, when it's privately owned, it's on the tax rolls being paid and stuff. There were private developers that were interested, but the Port Authority kind of chased them out of town, you know, because, hey, we got the money and uh, the city came in and bought the property, taking it off the market uh, uh, place. What should go on that site is something much greater uh, uh, development than a practice center for the uh, hockey team that's already been hugely subsidized by the taxpayers. Things like uh, uh, drug stores, which we have a drug store on darn near every corner nowadays, and, and, and it doesn't bring a development of it. So if you use that as an example of how the public subsidy really is bringing us more development, I think it's a clear-cut example of where the government has stepped in and actually pushed private development, private investment out of the marketplace, and we're actually getting an inferior. Because if you can't build a better development than what's being proposed there, that should be a very high uh, building, very dense building. <laughs> And it also would, if you had that kind of development, you would also spur development around there. A practice uh, hockey uh, team, uh, 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 a drugstore, is not going to spur, uh, and again, being a core block there, that really puts a blight on the long-term blight on the city. But at the taxpayer's expense, added to that, that skewing in the market to do that, you use the, uh, the Port Authority in this uh, case, and that, again, is being taxed. We, as taxpayers, let's say, are paying subsidies to subsidize the, uh, the Port Authority, which, again, raises the taxes for everybody else at our expense. But then what is, happens is, then there's a paid staff, paid for by the taxpayers, that goes out and competes at tax dollars, our tax dollars, against the private developers also goes up to the legislature with paid, again, with our tax dollars to lobby against the city, lobby, lobby for the Port Authority to get the terms on the uh, taxes and on the various other provisions against us, which undercuts our development. It really is a vicious circle that is killing this city uh, uh, because of the abuse of it. And it's been going on for a long time. And what happens then is, uh, the reason why a lot of these developments go with the Port Authority because you control the, the subsidies, and as a matter of fact, an example of it is it's, it goes back a few years, but Seeger Square with the redevelopment of the Seeger site. A developer comes in from out of state, wants to develop the site. The Port Authority comes up to him and says, hey, if you're developing that site, you're a developer with us. I said, no, we don't want you. No, we can get you money. They said, we don't want your money. We want to redevelop the site. Well, you know, if you want things really to work, you know, easily, and you want to get your permits and stuff, you know, you really should talk to us. Again, these are taxpayer paid for development interference that then goes to argue against private development in the, the city. So why I say this, and with the context of the tax increment financing, these things can get so perverted that they really are undermining uh, uh, the redevelopment of these areas. And so it's really important that it be very targeted to what it does, and it can't be used for these various purposes. Thank you. So, so you're referencing Macy's and, and 
I'll, I'll address your questions on that one and as, as best as I can. You are correct that there was another group that had it under contract. Um, there were actually two groups. The first group couldn't get to closing. They could not finance it. The second group was going to get it to closing. Um, and I'm sure that some of you have heard what the use was going to be and what was going to end up being it. That that building is 540,000 square feet of incredible amounts of concrete. Um, we talk about, you go through some of the, the really neat buildings in North Loop of Minneapolis and you hear the brick and timber buildings and some character to it. Macy's doesn't have that. It's concrete and then more concrete. Um, one thing I'll, I'll re reference on when I mentioned earlier eligible expenses, you cannot use TIF proceeds for recreational facilities. So when you hear it's true, we've talked about putting up, you know, um, an ice rink in there. TIF cannot be used for that. That's being financed, traditional financing. Um, but as for the second use that had it under contract, they were going to bring in and do uh, about 90% of the building was going to be all parking. They were not going to change the facade of the building, and they were going to put in about a 50,000 square foot state sex offender unit. It was not going to be for overnight housing. Um, the zoning was mentioned earlier. I believe that with current St. Paul downtown zoning would have been eligible. Um, I saw the pro forma from the developer. It was an incredible investment. You wouldn't have spent hardly anything and you would have made a ton of money. Um, so the question was asked, that was right around fall of 2013. If you all remember when the mayor brought his key issues to the legislature for the bonding bill in 2014, he had two key projects. One was the Palace Theater right across the street, and the other one was the expansion and growth of the Minnesota Children's Museum. And we agreed that when you're trying to expand the Children's Museum, probably not the best idea to have it connected by Skyway to the state sex offender unit. I mean, some people may agree with that. We didn't. And so we basically, yes, we stepped in and said, that's a use we did not want to see happen. The private sector had it under contract. They were going to make a financially very strong project. But I think if they're going to tie that building up for 20-some years of parking and, um, and not even changing the facade, that's what made that project work so well financially is they loved the way the building looked. We didn't. We did step in. I mean, I can't deny that. I mean, that's public. You know, we did buy it, and other people were trying to buy it. Um, we just didn't like the use. And um, we can disagree, and I, I think that's fine. I mean, um, there are a lot of people can, can say what we're trying to accomplish with that project is could be more, possibly. Um, we just kind of feel that, you know, we, we actually think at the end of the day, people are going to like the project. Um, I, I'm Jane Prince, and I'm on the City Council. And my question is probably best addressed to John Manillo and Lee Kruger. Um, we are doing the soccer stadium at Snelling University. And when the Met Council originally decided to leave the bus barn site in 1999, there were banner headlines in both dailies saying this is the most valuable development site in the metro area that is coming online. Um, and the Met Council basically has tied it up all this time. They wanted to use it for staging for the Green Line, so it's never been offered. But when the mayor and, and the team and city leaders decided it was a good site for soccer, Arguably, it became then a really valuable site because we're putting this beautiful new stadium there. We've got the best transit access, great highway um, access, so on and so forth. Arguably, not enough parking and too much traffic, but we've been assured that we can handle all that. So anyway, um, Rebecca, who had to leave, um, brought in a resolution when we approved the soccer deal. Um, and it said that we were making, that we would make a commitment as a city that this was, the rest of the site should be developed without TIF. That, that the rest of the site would no longer pass the but-for test, the pollution was going to be cleaned up, 
the transit's great, the highway's great, it's in the middle of the Twin Cities and it should be able to be developed. Um, Rebecca's resolution lost four to three. The mayor was strongly against it because we didn't want to take that tool out of the toolbox. But what's now proposed in the master plan that was approved by my colleagues two weeks ago is about, I don't know how many million square feet of office space that they want to put there. Large buildings that are intended to attract office developers and some housing developers. But if you look at the renderings and if you look at what the master plan states, it's hundreds of thousands of new square footage of office space. So that brings me to my question, which is if we use TIF on that site, when we have a 20% vacancy rate in downtown St. Paul, aren't we even competing against ourselves to re redevelop it? buildings. So you're decreasing the value of those buildings. So I would agree with that. Well, um, you know, I mean, obviously, we're the owner of a downtown building, and we sure want to see that succeed. Um, I, we, our involvement on it on the bus barn site, and again, that was another question that was asked. Sorry. To Jane to go off on a tangent, but one of the other questions was asked earlier about, uh, in effect, leading to responsible parties of cleanup. And I think the gentleman who stepped out, he's right. We usually do ha have to go for the, the person who created the problem, if you can find them and collect it. We bought the site from 3M on the Beacon Bluff site, and 3M was a great partner. And uh, I think they still kind of are, are finishing cleaning up some of the um, responsible uh, problems that they created. There were also some people before them that no longer exist, so you can't really chase them down. The bus barn site and um, the surrounding, uh, we have the environmental project management cleanup agreement to help clean up the bus barn site. We're trying to give some advice to people on, on the other projects, so I, I don't really know how to answer that, that um, whether or not you use TIF again. I think that's the master plan. I think that's the, the extreme position. Um, whether that ever gets built or not, that's another, um, uh, I think I'll let other people smarter than me answer that one because I think there's some complications there that um, we're ways away before that would ever be built. And a little bit of the counsel that we've given to people, there's still a lot of leasehold interests on the shopping center site that that's it's years away before something like that can happen. Okay, um, we need to stop at nine o'clock. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna really try and get through. But if you can make your question quickly, that would be really appreciated. I'm gonna try and jump in back and forth from side to side. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question and not give a speech. Uh, you mentioned in connection with the Midway Stadium site that part of your process is to decide you can't sell it unless you fix stuff, clean it up, whatever. What is that process? And is the information associated with making that decision? Is all of that information public? Um, that's a good question. I don't, and how we, like, uh, if you do a, I believe a phase one and a phase two report on it, and you find that it does become public within um, MPCA. So the reports are available to the public. Uh, there are a lot of long syllable words in there that I don't understand. People tell me, here's what you have to do. It might be petroleum based, it might be something else. And I, I'm, I'm a real estate guy, so I don't always understand that chemical side of it. But yes, those reports, I believe, phase two reports are made public through MPCA if you, if you wanted to read those. But as for our decision making, is that what you're asking? Okay, I'll give you an example. We have a small remnant parcel not too far from the old Carbonis site, the old Bongiorno site, kind of in the Williams Hill area. We believe the site's worth about $80,000, and we got a purchase agreement in at 40000 and this group would say, um, it just came in, we haven't even had a chance to act on it. And our, we have public hearings when we sell a property, so, and um, we have to have a 
five out of our seven board members vote, y vote yes on it. We're going to sell it for probably half the value because the buyer is going to take on the accountability and the liability cleaning up, which is, is fine. So when you come, if you were to come to our board meeting or our, our credit committee meeting and, and go through it, there would be our reports that say, you know, we have an appraised value of something like this. Um, we're going to sell it for this, and here's why. In that particular case, we think it's probably worth 80 if it's cleaned up. We're going to sell it for 40 and not clean it up and pass on the liability. That's how that particular one will be made. I don't know if that'll be on our September board agenda, probably maybe October, but that's going to be a, it's a small project. It's a 40 or 50 million, $50,000 project. But that would give you, hopefully that gives you an idea on our thinking on why we'll sell it for that price. I don't know if that helps, but um, I'm trying to answer as best I can. Hi, Erickson, uh, building owner in Lower Town. Uh, Many of us are concerned that the growth potential, which we think is quite considerable of the downtown area of St. Paul, is being constrained by the lack of parking, looking out in the future. Uh, and I, my ears popped up, Mr. Kruger, when I heard that the Macy's site was, uh, there was investors that were potentially gonna turn 90% of it into parking, uh, and it would've been a profitable project, I would assume, for them. They did their analysis on what the need of parking might be in downtown St. Paul, and then you came in and said that you made the decision uh, that uh, this uh, was not an appropriate use or good use for that building. And this is really, I think, what some people are getting at, is it's the outside forces coming in and meddling with the, with the market, and where other investors feel where it should go. Thank you. Well, just regarding parking on, on the Macy's, I mean, just to be clear, the, the existing Macy's building has 550 parking spots. When we're done with it, it's gonna have close to 800. So we, we realize that there's some benefit to expanding parking. Um, that building has two levels. If you're on the lowest level of that building standing on, the, how many of you have been to the, the River Room at, at the Macy's? How many of you have been to the level below that? Um, so you're 40 feet below grade, um, below the river groom. Um, so there's some areas that we found to be really hard to lease for office, retail, residential. So we are actually taking some areas that we think are unleasable and turning it into parking. So we're not saying that parking in itself is bad because we're, we're expanding the parking on that one. Probably 500, somewhere around there. I saw a copy of the drawings one time. It was going to be a substantial growth. Hi there. My name is Tim Holden. Um, it sounds like uh, TIF has a place. However, it's not being utilized to its fullest capacity in St. Paul. And there's a variety of reasons for that, I believe. Um, first, I would say, is it's as a city, we're somewhat desperate for commerce and desperate for development. Uh, the lack of leadership has created this problem where we have the government, in essence, competing against private individuals like myself to sustain ourselves. Now that's a problem. Lee, you answer to the mayor, I would, ima I would imagine. You talk with him regularly about things that are going to happen and not going to happen. Is that correct? Well, we, we have a board. The mayor appoints our board, so it's more indirect. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's pretty much an inside deal where you've got one or maybe five people that are making the major decisions, and that's affecting the whole city. And that's a problem. TIF financing has a place. It sounds like it's used in some respects beautifully, but when it's being done in some respects, it's it's... There's no transparency, no accountability, which is a problem. And I believe that Tom Goldstein said, the best thing we can do is to have transparency, which would give everybody, like you say, a website with knowledge of where that money's going, how much money that is going, the purpose, and exactly what the amount is that's gonna be repaid and when it's gonna be repaid. Fiscal responsibility is huge, and it's not happening. And St. Paul. When we're subsidizing multi, multi billionaires to build soccer stadiums and giving them free taxes for 50 years, that pisses me off. And I think it does a lot of other people as well. 
Thank you. So keep it to questions as quickly as possible. Or a question, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Miller. I'm a civilian who lives in St. Paul and labors in the real estate industry. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for your time, expertise, and experience. This is a tough subject. It's uh, almost like trying to understand Klingon, and Star Trek's been around for 50 years. Uh, but it's important, and I want to thank St. Paul Strong. It affects the funds available for the city, paying for public services, the county for human services, the school districts for educating our children, even the mosquito control district. So my question is, how important will TIF be, in your opinion, uh, to the future of economic development, especially for the purposes for which it was originally intended? And the, the way I got to that question, I think Mr. Gilbert observed that the use of TIF has declined the last few years. Senator Rest observed that development is cyclical, uh, but over the last 10 or 15 years, we have a major change in the use of eminent domain for economic development. The courts and then the legislatures prohibited that. TIF, I believe, as originally envisioned, was to address blight, especially in dense urban areas. And of course, that speaks to what you discussed, the panel discussed earlier about the importance of increment the uh, development of density then to create the, the very increment, and that speaks to blight in urban areas. Essential to that, um, and I'm focused more on downtown St. Paul, but I think it's true in other places, to assemble a block required the city to step in with eminent domain, and especially quick take eminent domain was a very efficient way to assemble a large parcel, build a large development, create the density. The impact, the full impact of the loss of the use of eminent domain I don't think has been fully felt, first of all because of the Great Recession from which we only recently recovered, and then kind of the anomaly that we've had some large development sites come available like the Ford site, Beacon Bluff or the 3M site, TCAP, even Macy's, and the probability of these sites being available in the future really isn't that clear. So how important do you think TIF will really be to, to address blight? Can somebody do that in about two minutes so we can get another question? Well, I, you know, it, it's not a matter of, um, uh, or, or I should say, uh, tax increment financing is, uh, the cities would claim, and I would agree with them, uh, and this is the League of Minnesota Cities, not just a single city, um, is one of the few tools that they have to, um, to promote um, economic prosperity um, uh, in their in their communities, uh, and so I think it's going to continue to be used. Um, there, um, we used to have um, these bonds that private development bonds. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, what, what exactly what they were? Where where. Um, um, Ten percent of them could be used for private development, and then then that tool uh, was taken away. And uh, uh, over and over again, the cities would say that there were tools that were out there that, by uh, action of government, whether it's a federal government or state government, that tool was taken away. And the only one left that has any real impact. And again, cities can do tax abatements on their portion of the tax on on um, commercial industrial property, primarily. But um, um, it's the one tool that they, that they have left. And it's whether their voters trust them to make good decisions about it. And um, I'm, you, know, you, you guys can decide whether that's the case in, uh, in St. Paul. It's going it's, to, it's certainly not going away anytime soon. And um, I mean, I really, I can't imagine um, a point at which we would say that um, no new TIF districts can be certified throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, that's not going to happen. Could I just add to that? Um, California, by the way, did do that um, uh, with all their CDCs. They've uh, dissolved them because of uh, TIF. Um, I don't know that we can't do that, but I would agree it probably is not going to happen. It's going to change, though. Uh, and it's different. When you look to a rural area, a farm 
community that wants to develop into a, a small city or whatever it is, they have a great uh, amount of space they can do that with and TIF increment they can do that with. In St. Paul, you don't have that. And another thing that's changing in St. Paul is the, um, uh, the Supreme Court ruling that came out a couple weeks ago that we can't hide all our street maintenance on right-of-way assessments. It has to be a, um, uh, on ad valorem, in other words, on the value of the property. And so uh, there's an effort to try to create transparency. That's a cer one thing that's going to do it, uh, that we'll see, in fact, you know, what are we spending the money on? Um, uh, and if we're not happy with it, eh, well, hopefully maybe people will vote about that <laughs> issue. Hi, my name is Kate Hunt, and I'm a taxpayer, and I'm becoming enlightened about TIF. What I've been hearing is that we've widely acknowledged problems in areas for improvement. I want to know how we can make our city officials responsible, accountable, and make the process transparent. Where's the mayor? We've had two city council members here, and I'm very disappointed that Ward 3 isn't here because we've talked a lot about the Ford development. Where is uh, planning and economic development from the city? They should be here right now answering, answering citizens' concerns and questions. So, <laughs> well, thank you. That just about wraps us up, and I, can, I think I can do a segue here. Um, in the spirit of St. Paul Strong and SPNN, which is really about an informed citizenry, and that's where we're going to make a change is when we as citizens learn about this and start asking all the questions, and more than just John Manillo asking questions, which obviously other people are too. But I think that the beauty of this evening was that we had a balanced, informative panel here, and I really want to give a big hand to all of them for their time and their <laughs> wisdom. And, and then I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and uh, basically participating in this because now you are ambassadors about TIFF and go out and tell the world, at least tell your neighbors because what they don't realize is when, you know, when taxes go up, what, why is that happening? And we need to look at all those pieces and this is a part of it, it's not everything. So please look for the YouTubes, share them around and I think the next, one of the next big steps would be to get, particularly in St. Paul, get the mayor and the whole city council and the county commissioners to sit down with us and talk to us about it. They're the ones who are making the decisions, but if they have an uninformed citizenry, how can we hold them accountable and transparent when we don't even know what is happening in these lines? So this was really, uh, door opening. We really appreciate it. And please uh, support St. Paul Strong, and we'll keep you in the loop on this. Oh, yes, and please <laughs> go, um, uh, you know, go and support our local business here and uh, keep the conversation going. Good night.